Today's lecture is on the topic of bipolar cylindrical coordinates. So, why do we need an, yet another coordinate system? Well, we've studied rectangular coordinates, and we've seen that those are well suited to problems in which the boundary on which we impose boundary conditions is of the form one of the coordinates is equal to a constant. So, if we have medium 1 over here on the left and medium 2 on the right, and they have a planar boundary between them, we were able to solve that in the case of a reflection and transmission of plane waves. Or, we also could solve the problem of a rectangular waveguide. In that case, each of the boundaries would be of the form, say on the left and right, x is equal to a constant, and on the top and bottom, y is equal to a constant. Rectangular coordinates would not lead to a tractable problem if we wanted to describe a circular waveguide. But in that case, we have circular cylindrical coordinates, rho, phi, and z, and then the surface is simply described by rho is equal to a constant. Or a variation on that is where we have a wedge type shape. Where one of the surfaces, pieces of the surface, is rho is equal to a constant, and the other two are phi is equal to a constant. So generally, for a problem to be tractable analytically, we need to have a coordinate system in which the surfaces, or the surface, at which we're imposing boundary conditions is described by one of the coordinates is equal to a constant. And then additionally, the coordinate system needs to be such that we can actually set up and solve the Helmholtz equation in that coordinate system. So we will also later look at spherical coordinates, and of course spherical coordinates are well suited to problems. Right? So R, theta, and phi are spherical coordinates. So that would be well suited to problems in which a surface is the radius r is equal to a constant. Or we can also look at problems where the uh, so-called polar angle theta is equal to a constant, and that will describe cones. So cones and spheres are well suited to spherical coordinates. But what about a problem? That's a very important practical problem. Uh, that looks like this, where we have two cylinders that are parallel. This is, of course, the two-wire transmission line. And we want to solve for the fields that can be supported on this two-wire transmission line. Well, we could use, of course, cylindrical coordinates for one of the cylinders, but then, and the, the z-axis then would be the uh, axis of that one cylinder, but then the other cylinder would be very difficult to describe. And we would not end up with a simple description of the second cylinder's surface. The first cylinder would be okay, but the second one would be a problem. And so this is where bipolar cylindrical coordinates come into play. And the two poles uh, are related to the two different cylinders, as we'll see. So to kind of motivate this, let's look at the following equations. So in any kind of cylindrical coordinates, u, v, and w, Cylindrical is going to mean that W is equal to the Z coordinate of rectangular coordinates. And that then describes a structure that has some cross section described by the U and V coordinates, and then the axis is described by uh, the Z coordinate. And so, how we usually set these coordinate systems up is 
In this case, we would say x is some function, x of u and v, and y is some function, y of u and v. And so toward that end, let's consider x is equal to the square root of c squared minus 1, where c is some constant, over c minus cosine of v, and y is equal to the sine of v over the same denominator, c minus cosine v. c is a constant greater than 1, and v is a parameter that we can interpret as an angle going from minus 180 to 180 degrees, or equivalently in radians, from pi, minus pi to pi. All right, so let's just take a look at what these actually look like by going to the computer and having the computer just trace out these x and y um, surfaces for v going from minus pi to pi for various values of the, of the uh, constant c. So here are plots with various values of the constant c, 1.15, 1.25, 1.5, and 2. Um, and then finally, c goes to infinity. And then we look at v um, at discrete values of 0, plus or minus 10 degrees, plus or minus 20 degrees, all the way up to plus or minus 180 degrees. So for the smaller value of c, uh, we get this outside curve, and here is v is 0 degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, etc., and then the negative values of v are on the mirror image down here. So you're getting something that looks like a circle, and indeed it is a circle. And then as c gets larger, you get these smaller circles, and then you collapse all the way down when c goes to infinity to this point right here. x is equal to 1, y is equal to 0. Now, if we took the mirror image of these, the negative x values relative to these x values over here, we would get a mirror image across the y-axis of another cylinder on the other side. And we'll see how we can actually set up the coordinates to, to do that. And so this will describe, then, two cylinders that are parallel with some separation, some, uh, each with some diameter. Now, here, as c goes to infinity, that's one of the poles in bipolar. So the first pole is over here at x equals 1, y is equal to 0. And the other one will be the mirror image over at x equals minus 1, y is equal to 0. So we need to just modify this a little bit to make them a little uh, more flexible in our ability to describe cylinders. And we'll see how we can do that. So here is the definition of bipolar cylindrical coordinates. x is equal to a sinh u over cos u minus cos v. y is equal to a sine v over the same denominator, cos u minus cos v, and z is equal to w. Where parameter u can vary from minus infinity to infinity, the parameter v, if we describe it in radians, varies from minus pi to pi, and of course z can also vary over all real values minus infinity to infinity. So that's the same z coordinate as we have in uh, rectangular and, and circular cylindrical coordinates. And now there's, it looks like we actually have four coordinates. We've got u, v, z, or w, and also a, but a is a parameter. 
we'll call the scale factor. And that's fixed. So it's not really a coordinate. We'll see how we can use that then to describe arbitrary, uh, uh, arbitrary set of parallel cylinders. But what about the uh, sense and cosh? So just to remind ourselves, maybe we haven't seen these very much since calculus. Cosh is the hyperbolic cosine, which is defined as e to the u plus e to the minus u over 2. And cinch is the hyperbolic sine, e to the u minus e to the minus u over 2. So for real values of u, these are real functions. And they grow exponentially for large positive or negative values of u. And so if you plot them out, they look something. If this is u here, cosh at u is equal to 0 is 1 plus 1 over 2 is 1. And then it grows symmetrically up to infinity. Right? And when u gets really big, it starts to look like just e to the u over 2. And the cinch at u is equal to 0 is 1 minus 1 over 2 is 0. And then it's asymptotic to the same e to the u over 2. But going in the other direction for negative values of u, it's an odd function replace u by minus u, you, you get, all right, so cinch of minus u is equal to minus cinch of u, whereas, oops, cosh of minus u is equal to plus cosh of u, and so the cinch goes off like that. So this is the cosh. And this is the cinch. They are related. You can show by these definitions that there's an important uh, identity, which is that the cinch squared is equal to the cosh squared minus 1. So here is a plot in which we go to the computer and tell it to plot contours of constant u. Those are the solid blue lines. And so as u goes to plus infinity, these circles collapse down to the pole at x equals 1 and y is equal to 0. And these are for the scale factor a is equal to 1. So if we set a is equal to 2, we would just get the same plot by scaled up, the whole thing scaled up by a factor of 2. Then as u decreases, you get these larger and larger circles over in the right half plane. All the way to u is equal to 0, you get a circle of infinite radius, which corresponds to the y-axis. And then for negative values of u, you get these circles over in the left-hand plane. And as u goes to minus infinity, these collapse down to the pole at x equals minus 1, y is equal to 0. So we would be able to use one of these circles to represent our uh, cylinder over on the right side, and then the other one with the value of u negated will be the mirror image cylinder over on the left side. And then we'll see that when we solve Maxwell's equations in this geometry, that these con other contours, u is equal to a constant, will correspond to the direction of the magnetic field. And then the dashed red curves, which are pieces of circles, those are the surfaces of constant V. So for a particular value of V, uh, we start over here on one of these cylinders, follow that uh, constant V contour over to the other cylinder. And we'll see that those will correspond to the direction of the electric field in our solutions. So once again, here is our x expression, a cinch u over cosh u minus cosine of v, and y equals a sine v over the same denominator, cosh u 
minus cos v. Now, let's look at the case where v is equal to zero or pi, zero or 180 degrees. Of course, then cos v would be equal to one or minus one. And sine of v in both cases would be equal to zero. And since y is proportional to the sine of v, then y would be equal to zero. So these would be values on the x-axis. And we're going to get two values because we're going to have cosine of v is one or minus one. And those two values then are going to be two values on either side of this circle. U is equal to a constant. And then over here in the left hand plane, we'll have the mirror image. And that'll correspond to u is equal to the negative, or whatever that constant is. Right? And you can see because cosh is an even function, that won't change the denominator, and it won't change the y expression, but it will just negate the x expression. So and in both cases, these two values of v, 0 and pi, will then tell us what these two points are on the left and right of those circles. So the difference of those will give us the diameter of the circle, which is twice the radius. Yeah, twice the radius. And the average of them will give us the center of the circle, which we'll call x0. And over here, it would be the negative of that would be the center and we'd have the same diameter, same radius. Okay, so let's express that and work out what those values are. Because at, uh, in those cases, x would be equal to a cinch u over cos u, and in the case of v is equal to zero, where the cosine of v is one, this would be minus one. And in the other case, it'd be minus minus one or plus one. And so those are the two x values that we're looking at. And so for, therefore, we can say that the, the radius of the circle will be one half the difference of these two x values. So that'll be one half a cinch u over well, see, the larger value, for at least for u, is equal to a positive constant, will be when we have the minus sign, so that'll give us a smaller denominator. So that will be over cos u minus 1, and then minus a cinch u over cos u plus 1, and we'll put absolute value signs around that because if we go over and do the same thing for u is negative then in that case uh, the first term will be this the most negative x value and the other one would be less negative and so we'll put absolute value over there so we always get a positive radius all right so we can uh, put these over a common denominator multiply the two denominators together so we'll get cos squared of u, and then plus cosh minus cosh cancels, and then minus one. And for the numerator, well, we'll get a cinch u times cosh u plus one, minus a cinch u times cosh u minus one. Well, the a cinch u times cosh u will cancel minus a cinch u cosh u, and then I'll leave this then, a cinch u times one, minus minus one times a cinch u, is 2a cinch u, and that 2 will cancel the half and leave a cinch u. Now we can use our identity. Cosh squared u minus 1 is equal to cinch squared u, and therefore this will be a, because you have cinch squared in the denominator, cinch in the numerator, so we'll cancel one factor of cinch. We'll have cinch u. Absolute value of a over cinch u is equal to the radius.
Now let's work out the center, x0. That'll be the same calculation, but with a plus sign here instead of minus. x0 is going to be, well, let's see. We're going to get the same denominator. Roche squared u minus 1, which is cinch squared. But now with the plus sign, well, now we're going to get the terms that will cancel will be a cinch u times 1 plus a cinch u times minus 1. And then the terms that won't cancel will be a cinch u cos u plus a cinch u cos u. That's 2 a cinch u cos u. The 2 cancels with a half, leaving a cinch u cos u. And now remember that cos squared minus 1 is cinch squared, so that cancels a cinch here and leaves you with a cos u over cinch u. And we don't need an absolute value sign because if u is positive, well, we get this x0 over on the right. And if u is negative, well, we get the minus x0 over on the left. So now we can write this, x0 over r, right? Here's, here's our r, and here's our x0. And if we divide those, well, we cancel out the a over since u, and it's just equal to cos u. And we're, we'll look specifically at the case where here we're over in the right half plane and u is greater than 0. Now we also, uh, if u is greater than zero, then, then this expression in the absolute value is positive, so we can drop the absolute value sign. We can also see that a is r cinch u. And so now this tells us how to find the value of u that corresponds to the surface of one of our cylinders. We set u0 is equal to the inverse hyperbolic cosine of x0 over r, the center over the radius. Uh, we can also write that as the inverse hyperbolic cosine of the center to center separation over the diameter. All right, so if we go up here, this. Uh, that separation there we'll call big D, and the diameter then is, of course, 2 times R. So that gives us our U0, and then A is just R cinch U0. And so that solves for, then for our scale parameter A and the parameter U0 that corresponds to our right cylinder, and then the left cylinder is just u is equal to minus u0. So now we can set up a geometry in which we have two cylinders with arbitrary diameter and arbitrary center to center separation. And using the um, fact that since u0 is the square root of cos squared u0 minus 1, we can also re-express this as we still have u0 is equal to the inverse hyperbolic cosine of big D over little d. And then we can represent a as 1 half the square root of big D squared minus little d squared. And that comes from the fact that from this expression here, cosh of u0 is big D over little d. So you'd have big D over little d squared minus 1. And that would be cinch u0. And then a is just r times that. But r is little d over 2. So you'd have a 1 half little d, bring that inside, that'd be d squared 
And so big D squared over little d squared minus one times little d squared is big D squared minus d squared. So that's just some algebra that can be a, a simpler expression. You don't have to then calculate uh, the cinch there. So that's the relation between the scale factor and the parameter u0 then that defines our two cylinders which have diameter little d and center to center separation big D. So as an example, suppose we wanted to have cylinders of radius one and with a center to center separation of four. Okay, well then our u zero would be the inverse cosh of four over one, which is 2.063, etc. And our scale factor A would be one half the square root of big D squared, four squared, minus little d, which is one, one half the square root of 15, which is 1.936, etc. Okay. So that sets up our boundaries, the surfaces of the two cylinders. So now we're gonna have to figure out the problem of solving the Helmholtz equation in this rather unusual coordinate system. So what we need in this coordinate system is, first we start off with our vector position, x, y, and z. And then we express x and y in terms of the u and v. And then we look at the scale factors, hu, which is the norm length of partial with respect to u of vector position. And we look at hv, which is the partial with respect to v of vector position. And of course, z is still one of our coordinates. And so H, hc, of course, is just equal to 1. And then we form the unit vectors in the u direction, which is 1 over the scale factor times partial derivative with respect to u of vector position. Okay, so that's just that vector divided by its norm, so it's unit vector. And av, likewise, 1 over hv partial with respect to v of vector position. Now, in doing these derivatives, um, an important fact is that you can easily show from the definition of the cosh that its derivative is the cinch, and the derivative of the cinch, conveniently, is the cosh. And remember also that we have our identity that cosh squared can be written as cinch squared plus one, or cinch squared is equal to cosh squared minus one, either way. Okay, so now we're gonna apply these. We need to look at our expressions for x and y in terms of u and v, and go through and do these calculations. So here's x. A cinch u or cos u minus cos v and y a sine v over cos u minus cos v. So let's look at the uh, scale factor. So what is the u derivative? of vector position r, well, let's see, that's going to be the u derivative of x and the u derivative 
of y, and of course the u derivative of z is, uh, is equal to zero. So what is the u derivative of x? Here's our x expression. So we've got denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the, of the denominator over the denominator squared. And we've got an overall factor of a out here. So that will be denominator times the derivative of the numerator, which will be cosh, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator with respect to u, and that would be derivative of cosh with respect to u, which would be cinch. That whole thing over the denominator squared. Okay, so that is equal to, well, let's see, here we're gonna have a cosh squared minus a cinch squared. Well, look up here. Cosh squared minus cinch squared would be equal to one. So that would give us a one. And then we'd have minus cosh u cos b. over the denominator. And we also need the u derivative of y. Okay, what are we gonna get there? Okay, again, denominator times the derivative of the numerator, but the derivative of the numerator with respect to u is, is zero because it doesn't depend on that. Then be minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. We'll have an a, a out in front. So minus the numerator sine v times the derivative of the denominator with respect to u. Well, that's the derivative of cosh with respect to u. So that's cinch u over the same denominator cosh u minus cos v squared. Then to get uh, the v derivative of r, of course, that's going to be the v derivative of x, v derivative of y, and the z does not depend on u or v. So we would also need here the v derivative of x. Uh, let's see, in that case, a little simpler because in, the, in that case, the numerator does not depend on v. So we'll have denominator times the derivative of the numerator, which is zero, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. Derivative of the denominator is derivative of, of this with respect to v. Well, that would be derivative of the cosine with respect to v is minus sine, and then the minus gives you minus minus is plus. So that would be a sine of v. Okay, so we would have that would be then a times minus cinch u sine v over the same denominator squared cos u minus cos v squared. And how about the v derivative of y? Okay, in that case, denominator times the derivative of the numerator, derivative of sine is cosine. So pull out our factor of a, and we'll have the denominator, cos u minus cos v times the derivative of this sine, which is cos v, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. And the derivative of the denominator with respect to v, again, is cos, the derivative is minus sine, and then minus minus is plus, so it's sine of v. So it's sine of v times sine of v, or sine squared v, all over the same denominator. And looking at that, here we've got minus sine squared, and here's a minus cosine squared. Well, sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. So we can write that as a 
cos u cos v minus 1 over this denominator cos u minus cos v squared. So now we need to work out our scale factor hu. That's the norm of partial with respect to u of r, right? And that would be then the norm of this, which would be the square root of partial with respect to u of x squared plus partial with respect to u of y squared. So we're going to have then partial with respect to u of x squared plus the partial with respect to u of y squared. What is that going to look like? Here are those two expressions. So they're going to have the same factor a over this cos u minus cos v squared, everything squared. So let's put that here. That'll be a squared over cos u minus cos v squared squared, or to the fourth power. And then what else do we get? So that'll be that times, what else do we have? Well, we have one minus cos, cos u cos v squared plus minus sine v cinch u squared. So what does that look like? That is one minus cos u cos v quantity squared plus cinch u sine v squared. Let's get rid of that for, for now. We'll come back and put everything up there in a minute first let's do some algebra on this so we can expand that out as one minus um two cos u cos v plus cos squared u cos squared v plus cinch squared u sine squared v. And then we can do a little more algebra on that. So we're trying to reduce 1 minus 2 cos u cos v plus cos squared u cos squared v plus cinch squared u sine squared v and what we can do is keep these first terms here and try to manipulate these cinch and sine terms so we're going to write cinch squared as cos squared u minus 1. And we're going to write sine squared as 1 minus cosine squared of v. That we only now have only cosine of v and cos of u. So what are we going to get if we do that? Let's see. Uh, here we're going to have minus 1 times 1. That's going to cancel this one. We're going to have then um, a cos squared times 1. We'll put that right here. And then we're going to have our this term here, minus 2 cos u cos v. And then look here. We're going to have a cos squared u cos squared v, and then cos squared u minus cos squared v. Those will cancel out. And then finally, we'll just be left with minus 1 times minus cos squared, which will be plus cos squared. And that, very conveniently, is equal to cos of u minus the cos of v quantity squared.
And you got this guy squared, that squared, and then minus 2, the cross product. Well, that's wonderful because we looked then at partial u with respect, uh, a partial uh, of x with respect to u squared plus the partial of y with respect to u squared. It had a factor a squared over cos u minus cos v squared squared to the fourth, but now it's going to be multiplied by that factor squared, so that's going to cancel one of the squared terms, and it just leaves this. And then hu is the square root of this, so that's going to be a over, and let's notice now that cos of u um, is greater than or equal to 1, and cos of v is less than or equal to 1, so this can never be negative. The denominator can never be negative, and so we can just take the square root, get rid of the square sign there, and give cos u minus cos v. Now, that was a lot of work, and then we have to work out what the hv is. If you go back and you look at our, all right, so hv would come from the v derivative of x squared plus the v derivative of y squared. But if you go back and look at those expressions, there's some rearrangement, but you're going to get the same thing for when you take the sum of the squares, exactly the same expression. So this is equal to hu. So we get a twofer on that. Then we need the unit vectors for the in the direction of the different coordinates, a hat u. And so we can just go back and take our u derivative of x, u derivative of y, 0, over our hu. And now that's relatively easy to go through and do. You can just go back and look at what the these expressions are, what you get is that this is equal to 1 over cos u minus cos v one minus cos u cos v um, minus since u sine v and zero and for a v you get the same factor out in front one over cos u minus cos v minus since u sine v Cos u, cos v minus 1, 0. And looking at these, you notice that the, this has the same x and y values, but they're flopped. And then this expression is negative of this one. So if you take the dot product of these, you get this times that plus that times that, which would just be the negative of the first product. And so it's very clear then that a hat u dot a hat v is equal to zero. And of course, because neither of these have a z component, a hat u dot a hat z is equal to a hat v dot a hat z is equal to zero. So these are indeed an orthogonal system of coordinates. The unit vector, unit coordinate vectors are everywhere orthogonal. So now we need some of the differential operators. And this might look like it's going to be nightmarish, but it fortunately turns out to be not quite so bad. The gradient of a scalar f is in general a u hat 1 over h u partial with respect to u of f plus a v hat 1 over h v 
partial with respect to V of F plus a Z hat one over H C, which is one, the partial with respect to Z of F. Now, since H U and H V are the same, and one over that is cos U minus cos V over A, we've got that times a u hat partial with respect to u of f plus a v hat partial of f with respect to v. And then we've got then our a z hat partial with respect to z of f. So that is the gradient. Now the Laplacian in general, back to our lecture on orthogonal coordinate systems, as the kind of messy expression, one over h u h v h w, which would be h c in our case, the u derivative of h v h z over h u times the u derivative of f plus one over h u h v h z times the v derivative of h z h u over h v times the v derivative of f plus one over h u h v h z times the z derivative of h u h v over h c times the z derivative of f. Well, let's see. h z is one. Let me get rid of those. And h u is equal to h v. So in here, these cancel. That's convenient. These cancel. That's nice. And HU and HV, neither of those depend on Z. So with respect to this derivative, they're constants, and we can pull them out, and then they'll cancel these. Those cancel. That's nice. And so this actually is not as ugly as we might have worried it would be. The Laplacian of F, then, is equal to 1 over HU, HV, but HU is equal to HV. So that's just 1 over HU squared. So that's just this guy squared. So that's cos u minus cos v squared over a squared. And then this will be the second derivative with respect to u of f. And over here, we'll have the second derivative with respect to v of f. And then here, we'll have just the second derivative with respect to z of f. There's the Laplacian. Okay, so that's not, not so bad. Um, not as simple as it would be in rectangular coordinates where we would just have right, second derivative with respect to x and y and z of f. We've got this additional factor out in front. But we'll see that we can end up with solutions that don't depend uh, on z or alternately, their dependence on z ends up canceling out with another factor, and then we end up with just with this expression equal to zero, and then we can just get rid of this coefficient and then just set this equal to zero, and then it looks just like a two-dimensional um, Laplacian in a rectangular coordinate system. Okay, so that's kind of nice. So let's let's build up to that by starting off with an electrostatics problem. Let's look at the problem of Two wires separated by big D with diameters little d, and they're charged up so that we have plus Q charge on this one and minus Q charge on the other one. And we want to solve for the voltage V as a function of U and V. And this 
the x and y here. We want to solve just Laplace's equation, not the Helmholtz equation yet. So, this is going to be a problem that has no z dependence. Everything is uniform in z, and so this term here goes away, and then we have just the, the Laplacian of the voltage is equal to zero, and that's got a factor out here that we can cancel. And so what we get then is that the second derivative with respect to u of v plus the second derivative with respect to v of v is equal to zero. So no z term because there's no z dependence in this simple problem. Now, remember that u is equal to a constant describes circles. And specifically, when u is equal to u0, that's the right cylinder, and u is equal to minus u0 is the left cylinder. And of course, those are surfaces of constant potential, of constant voltage. So that suggests that it may be possible to have v to be only a function of u. Because we know, at least in the case where u is equal to u0 or minus u0, the voltage is indeed only a function of that parameter u. So if that's the case, then our Laplace's equation just becomes the second with respect to u of v is equal to 0. And that simply has a solution of the form v is equal to a constant times u plus another constant. Is the linear function. All right. And if we say that the voltage over here on this wire is plus V0 um, over 2, and the voltage on the other wire is minus V0 over 2, so that the voltage difference is V0, then our solution would just be that v is equal to v0 over 2 u0 times u. Why? Because when u is equal to u0, this is v0 over 2. And when u is minus u0, then this is minus v0 over 2. And then in between, these circles of other values of u is equal to a constant will be surfaces of constant voltage. And the y-axis, which is u is equal to zero, will be a surface of zero potential. So positive potential on the right, negative potential on the left. What is the electric field? Well, the electric field in an electrostatics problem is minus the gradient of the voltage. Minus the gradient of the voltage. Well, here was our gradient. And the voltage depends only on u, so we only have the first term. We only have this right here. So it's this cos u minus cos v over a times a u hat, the u derivative of potential. That will be, and we also have the minus sign there, so it'll be minus cos u minus cos v over a, uh, the derivative with respect to u of this is just this coefficient, v0 over 2u0, and then times a u hat. And those contours corresponding to a u hat end up being the contours of constant v. And that's what we said before, that the, those contours of constant V correspond then to electric field lines. So the electric field E is minus quantity cos U minus cos V over A times voltage V0 over 2U0 A hat U. 
And remember, our geometry looks like this. This is u is equal to minus u0. And the right wire is u is equal to plus u0. AU hat points in the direction of increasing u. Remember that u increases towards infinity in this direction here. So that would be a u hat would be, and of course it would be perpendicular to a surface of constant u, so it would be an inward pointing surface normal. And the outward pointing surface normal then would be minus a u hat. So that would be the minus here and the a u hat. And so therefore over on this uh, right cylinder, e dot the surface normal would be minus a u hat dot this expression that would just get rid of the minus a u hat and that would be cos u minus cos v over a v zero over two u zero so that is the normal component of the electric field and the electric field then would go you know follow one of these lines of constant v and over on the other conductor, it would be the negative of this. It would be an inward pointing electric field, and here would be an outward pointing, assuming that we have a positive voltage and positive charge on this one, and negative voltage and negative charge on the other. Now remember, from the boundary conditions on a perfect conductor, the relation between the normal electric field and the surface charge density. Surface charge density is equal to the normal component of the electric flux density, which is epsilon times the normal component of the electric field. And so we get that QS then is just epsilon times this expression here. Epsilon V0 over 2U0 cos U minus cos V over A. Now what we want to do is now integrate that over a cylinder here, one of these cylinders, to figure out what the actual value of Q is in relation to the voltage difference between the cylinders V0. So we're going to need to look at, well, let's see, when we go to integrate on this, this is a surface of constant U. And so we only need to integrate over V, right? So V from minus pi to pi would take us around this circle. And so the charge DQ is going to look like this QS times DS, a little bit of surface element. So what is DS? Okay, so let's look at a piece of the surface here. So we would have, of course, dz coming out of the board. And then this is a surface of constant u. So as we vary v, this would be hv dv, right? Because the definition of the scale factor hv is that that is the displacement, the length displacement when the coordinate v changes by dv, this length is hv dv. So we would have hv dv times dz would be our ds. Well, what is hv? hv is just the inverse of this. It's a over cos u minus cos v. So when we multiply ds times qs, we just get rid of this term right here. And so this becomes epsilon v0 over 2 u0 dv dz. And so the total charge on the wire then would be q epsilon v0 over 2 u0. And let's uh, look at one, one meter in the z direction, so this will be a charge per meter in the z direction. And then we'll integrate, that's dz, from minus pi to pi. 
dv. And so that integral gives you uh, a factor of 2 pi, and this gives you just a factor of 1. And so the factor of 2 pi, this 2 will cancel that 2, two and the 2 pi, and this will give you pi epsilon v0 over u0. Now remember that u0 was equal to the inverse hyperbolic cosine of big D over little d. That is over the, remember that that's, here is big D, the center to center separation, and little d is the diameter of each of the wires. So there's an expression for the charge on one of the cylinders. Well, capacitance is equal to charge divided by voltage. But what's the voltage between the wires? That's just V0. And therefore, we get that this is equal to pi epsilon over the inverse hyperbolic cosine of d over little d. And that's the exact solution for the capacitance of parallel wires. Now, if you have parallel wires, an important uh, physical phenomenon is the question of how much voltage can you put between them before you get dielectric breakdown and, the, and you get a spark uh, between the, the wires. You break down the dielectric uh, strength of air. So let's look at the, uh, the magnitude of the electric field. Here's the electric field. So the magnitude of it would be, uh, this of course is a unit vector, unit magnitude. So it'd be this expression, and then remember we said that cos u minus cos v is never negative, so the magnitude of this would just get rid of the minus sign there. And we get then that the magnitude of the electric field is cos u minus cos v over a, v0 over 2u0. And now the question is, where is that maximum? Where do we get the maximum value of that? Well, let's see, right? It will be when this factor here is as big as possible. And that would be when u is as big as possible and cos v is as small as possible. So that minus that would be as big as possible. And so what would that be? Let's see, well, that would be u gets no bigger than u0. That's when we're on the surface of the right conductor. So the biggest value of u would be u0. So this would be cos u0. And then minus cos v is biggest when v is pi. And that's over here. Little v is equal to pi. And then cos v would be minus 1. And minus minus 1 would be plus 1 over a. V0 over 2 U0. And that would be the maximum electric field. And you could do some, use some of our formulas for it, cos U0 and so on and manipulate that. But this would be basically tell you that the maximum electric field is going to occur right here at the inner surface of the right wire. And you'll get correspondingly the negative of that over here on the left wire. So if there's going to be dielectric breakdown, it's going to occur right at the points that are nearest to each other on the two wires. And that would be the maximum value of the electric field. So you could use that to decide what would be the maximum voltage between the wires you could have to be safe from dielectric breakdown.